Now, a couple of years ago, two Tasmanian preachers had a legal complaint made against them for preaching the biblical view of marriage. This year, of course, you would know full well that Israel Folau lost his career for posting on Twitter that sinners were bound for hell unless they repented and turned to Jesus. Now, of course, these are just some of the more public examples of the persecution that you and I may have already faced or will inevitably face at some point. I have had friends, Christian friends, who have had abuse held at them for wanting to share the gospel. I myself was at the hairdresser a few weeks ago, and uh, the hairdresser asked me uh, what I did, and I said, I go to college, I study the Bible, I'm training to be a preacher. I said, what about yourself? Are you religious? And he, you can fill in the gaps, but there were a lot of profundities as he held his scissor to my head. Now, persecution is to be expected. Jesus said, if they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. As Christians will be, identif- will be persecuted for identifying with Christ. And as the divide between Christianity and secularism in Australia grows, so too does the hostility of our society towards us. So how can we possibly stand firm in the face of this increasing persecution? Today's passage addresses this question by taking us behind the scenes. As Will mentioned last year, we looked through the first 11 chapters of the book of Revelation. Today we'll be picking uh, picking up where we left off and continuing to the end of the book in the following weeks. So let me set the scene just very briefly. First 11 chapters, in the body of it, we've seen seven seven, um, trumpets, seven uh, scrolls, and they depict the judgment of God. Now, in chapter 12, um, John takes a bit of an aside to address the issue of persecution. Now, we have to remember the context of this book. The book of Revelation was written by John in the first century and addressed to Christians in Asia Minor to challenge and comfort them who were suffering under persecution from the Roman Empire. And what this book reveals is the heavenly perspective on world history using symbolic imagery. And this imagery is drawn from the Old Testament. It forms a genre known as apocalyptic literature. And so as we read this type of literature, we have to keep in mind that it is rich with symbolism and is not to be read literally. literally. And the point of all this is to enable readers like you and me to understand how to live in the present, in the here and now. So, Revelation 12 to 13 takes us behind the scenes to see the enemy and his tactics so that we will know what to expect and how to respond in the present, in the here and now. So three points on your outline. First, two signs. Second, the war in heaven. And third, the war on earth. First, there are two signs. And the first sign is a woman. Look at verse 1. And a great sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and on her head a crown of twelve stars. In verse 2, she is pregnant and about to give birth. In verse 5, she gives birth to a male child. Now, who does the woman sound like to you? Who does it sound like? Sounds like Mary, doesn't it? But it's not. Look again at verse 1 and look at the description. She's clothed with the sun, standing on the moon, wearing a crown of 12 stars. What story or dream in the Old Testament does this remind you of? Joseph's dream, doesn't it? In Joseph's dream, there's a sun, a moon, and and 11 stars, and they bow down to Joseph. When he told this dream to his family, they weren't too happy with him, were they? Why? Because the sun was his father. The moon was his mother, and the 11 stars represented his 11 brothers. Now, we know that Jacob's name was also Israel, and that Jacob's 12 sons became the 12 tribes of Israel. So who is the woman? The woman isn't Mary. The woman is Israel, the Old Testament people of God. In verse 5, the woman gives birth to a male child, one who is to rule all the nations with a rod of iron. 
Now here's another reference back to the Old Testament. It's a reference to Psalm chapter 2, verse 9. Now if you have your Bibles with you, turn with me to Psalm chapter 2. This is important to look at. Psalm chapter 2, verse 9. And you'll find that on page 448 in the Pew Bibles. Now, Psalm chapter 2 is all about God's King, the Messiah. Just scan through the first few verses. They speak about the nations and the kings of the earth conspiring against God and his anointed one. But in verse 4, God laughs because he has set his king on Zion. Who is this king? Well, God calls him his son in verse 7. And God says to him in verse 8, Ask of me, and I'll make the nations your heritage, and the ends of the earth your possession. You shall break them with a rod of iron. So back to Revelation chapter 12. Who is the male child? The male child is the one who fulfills Psalm chapter 2. He's the one that God calls his son and that God has set as king over all the nations. He's Jesus, the promised one who came out of Israel. So that's the first sign. The second sign is a dragon. Look at verse 3. And another sign appeared in heaven. Behold, a great red dragon with seven heads and ten horns and on his heads seven diadems. Now, in language, in the language of apocalyptic literature, this is a description of a very powerful dragon. The ten horns remind us of the fourth beast of Daniel chapter 7, which we also read. In Daniel's vision, four beasts rise out of the sea. But the fourth beast with ten horns is the most terrifying and the most powerful of them all. And so the ten horns of the dragon symbolize his terrifying power. The dragon also has seven heads and seven diadems or crowns. Now I don't know how the ten horns are distributed among the seven heads, but that's not the point. In apocalyptic language, seven is the divine number symbolizing completeness. And so the seven heads and the seven diadems or crowns symbolize the dragon's pretentious claim to divine wisdom and kingship. The dragon pretends to be God, but isn't. So who is the dragon? You'll be pleased to know that this one's more straightforward. Verse 9 tells us, And the great dragon was thrown down, that ancient serpent who is called the devil and Satan, the deceiver of the whole world. The dragon is none other than the devil or Satan. And in verse 4, he stood ready to destroy Jesus at the moment of his birth. Look at verse 4. And the dragon stood before the woman who was about to give birth, so that when she bore her child, he might devour it. Now we know from Matthew's Gospel, it's the Christmas story, right? Uh, With a bit after the Christmas story, that King Herod attempted to kill Jesus soon after his birth. After Herod heard about the birth of a new king, he tried to find out where this new king was born so that he could get rid of his new rival. But when he couldn't find out, he ordered the killing of every male child two years old or under in and around Bethlehem. What Revelation 12 reveals is that behind this human attempt by Herod to kill Jesus was Satan. That behind the scenes, Satan was at work trying to destroy God's king. This brings us to a very important assumption. And that is, of course, that Satan is real. This is the consistent assumption of the book of Revelation and the whole Bible. Now, in our secular Western society, Satan is the stuff of fairy tales and myths. He's merely a symbol of evil as a cartoon character or that voice in your head. But he's not a real being. He's not real because I can't see him or hear him or touch him. In fact, anything that I can't see or hear or touch can't be real. We operate on the assumption that the physical and material is all there is to our world. 
But the Bible operates on a very different assumption. The Bible assumes that beyond the physical, what we can hear and see and touch, there is also a spiritual realm within, within which Satan and his evil forces exist and are at work. Many times in the gospel narratives, we read of Jesus driving out demons and unclean spirits. And Jesus explained his ministry in terms of doing battle with Satan. So Mark chapter 3, for example, when his opponents accused him of casting out demons by the power of Satan, Jesus replied that actually he had come to overthrow Satan and release people from under the power of death. So, what are you and I to believe then? Well, I want to suggest to you that if you believe in what is written of Jesus in the Bible, and you profess faith in Jesus, you're a Christian, in other words, then you must also believe the Bible's assumption that there is a spiritual realm within which Satan and his evil forces are at work in this world. Now, if you're worried that people will think you're stupid for believing such things, you don't need to be. Because you already believe that Jesus is God born as a human, that Jesus died and then three days later came back to life, and that Jesus ascended to heaven. People already think you're stupid. You don't need to worry about that. Let me give you two reasons why it's important for Christians to believe in the Bible's assumption. First, if you don't believe that Satan is real, then you'll never actually understand why there's evil in our world. And you always be surprised when evil happens. Second, and we'll talk more about this later in the second point, if you don't believe that Satan is real, then you'll fail to see who the true enemy is and you'll be very poorly prepared when he attacks. Satan is real and behind the scenes he stood ready to destroy Jesus, but he failed, verse 5. Verse 5 tells us, The woman gave birth to a male child, one who is to rule all the nations with a rod of iron, but her child was caught up to God and to his throne. So in the space of half a verse, we're taken from Jesus' birth all the way to his ascension. All the details in between don't matter at this point because the key point underlying this is that Satan has failed. God has already enthroned his son, Jesus, as king in heaven. Now from verse 7, we're taken to a war in heaven. And this is the second point on your outline. The war in heaven. In verses 7 to 9, Satan and his angels do battle with Michael and his angels, but they are defeated and they're thrown out of heaven. Verses 7 to 9 is the event. Verses 10 and following is the interpretation of that event. So look at verse 10. And I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, Now the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ has, have come. For the accuser of our brothers has been thrown down, who accuses them day and night before our God. The question is, when did this happen? When was Satan defeated and thrown out of heaven? Well, turn with me back to Revelation chapter 5. Turn back a few pages to Revelation chapter 5. In Revelation 5, there's a scroll. But no one's worthy to open this scroll. No one's worthy to open it or to look into it. But if, if you look at verse 5, there is one called the Lion of Judah who has conquered and is able to open the scroll. Why? Verse 6 tells us. It's because the Lion of Judah is also the lame who has been slain. And so in verse 9, there's a song that's sung. And they sang this song. Worthy are you to take the scroll and to open its seals. For you were slain and by your blood you ransomed people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. So back to Revelation 12. When was Satan defeated and thrown out of heaven? Well, he was defeated and thrown out of heaven 
when the Lion of Judah, the slain lamb, that is Jesus, died on the cross. That's when it happened. But how does this actually work? How does Jesus dying on a cross defeat Satan? Well, to answer this, we must understand Satan's power, his weapon. Satan's great power, his weapon, lies in his words, in his accusations. You can see it there in verse 10. He's the accuser who accuses people day and night before God. So picture a courtroom. God is the judge. Satan is the prosecutor. Satan, the prosecutor, says to God, the judge, look at Joe. He's a sinner. He's not fit for heaven. You know what he's done, how he's lived his whole life against you. He deserves to be condemned. He deserves to be judged and to be thrown into hell. And do you know what? Satan is right. I am a sinner. I'm not fit for heaven. And I deserve to be condemned by God. And so do you. But Jesus died in our place, the lamb who was slain. His death paid the penalty for our sins in full. And his blood has wiped away the guilt of our rebellion against God. So that now when Satan, the prosecutor, stands before God, the judge, and he says, look at Joe, he's a sinner, he's not fit for heaven, he deserves to be condemned. God says to him, no, he doesn't. My son has died in his place and taken away his guilt. And I've declared him to be not guilty because of Jesus. Jesus' death has taken away Satan's power to accuse those who have put their trust in Jesus. That's how Satan has been defeated and thrown out of heaven. But even though he's been defeated, he hasn't been destroyed yet. And he now pursues God's people in rage. Look at verse 12. But woe to you, O earth and sea, for the devil has come down to you in great wrath because he knows that his time is short. Now, how does it work that Satan is defeated on one hand but he's not destroyed on the other hand? You may have heard it explained as being like the time between D-Day and the final end of World War II. Uh, on, on the 6th of June, 1944, or D-Day, the Allied forces invaded northern France along the coast of Normandy. And that victory at that battle laid the foundations for the, for the final surrender of Germany. That's why this battle has been called the beginning of the end of the war in Europe. But before Germany finally surrendered a year later, the Allies continued to face resistance as they marched on towards Germany. Jesus' victory over Satan at the cross was like D-Day. It was the beginning of the end. But while Satan was defeated, he wasn't destroyed yet. And so Satan continues to resist by pursuing God's people. In verse 13, he pursues the woman who, who we've already seen is Israel. Um, and in verse 17, he makes war on the rest of the woman's offspring. Who are they? They are those who keep the commandments of God and hold to the testimony of Jesus. They're Christians. In other words, the woman and her offspring represent both the Old and New Testament people of God both of whom have Satan as their enemy. Notice that in verse 13, the woman flees into the wilderness where she is nourished for a time, times, and a half. That is, three and a half times. Or in verse 6, she is nourished for 1,260 days. If you have your calculators with you, 1,260 days is 42 months, 42 months, is three and a half years. Three and a half years is half of seven years. 
And if the number seven represents completeness, like I said earlier, then half of seven, three and a half, represents a falling short of the fullness of time. In other words, this period of Satan waging war on the saints, this period of persecution, is limited. His time will come to an end when Christ returns to establish his eternal rule. Satan knows this. He knows that his time is short. That's why he's so determined in his attacks. So what Revelation 12 reveals, that if the assumption is Satan is real, then what this reveals is that our true enemy is Satan. Satan is the true enemy of the people of God. He's, having been defeated and thrown out of heaven, he's now chasing after Christians. So I wonder who do you think are our enemies? Who are those who you think are against us? and persecuting us for our faith. I thought about this question during the week, and the things that come to my mind are the political left and their progressive allies, or mainstream media and big businesses. Maybe you think Rugby Australia and GoFundMe. Yes, persecution is coming from these groups, but Revelation 12 makes clear that the one who stands behind every attack is Satan. Satan is our true enemy. And knowing this is important because it helps us to see where the real battle is. The real battle is not primarily against any political or social group. It's not against hostile journalism or corporate voices. It's not against Rugby Australia or their sponsors. The real battle is against Satan and his forces. So don't get distracted. We're fighting a spiritual battle against a spiritual enemy which means we need to be equipped spiritually. How do we fight against such an enemy? Look at verse 11. And they, that's believers, have conquered him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony, for they love not their lives even unto death. Therefore rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell in them. How do we fight in this spiritual battle against a spiritual enemy? We turn to Jesus, our Saviour. For by his blood we have been freed from our sins and Satan's power of accusation. We hold fast to the word of the gospel. For that is how we share in Christ's victory over Satan. That is the message which says that Christ has won and Satan has been defeated. Brothers and sisters, our true enemy is Satan, but he's a defeated enemy whose time is short. He cannot win. In chapter 13, we're introduced to the two beasts which Satan uses to carry out his war against Christians. And this is the third point on your outline, the war on earth. The first beast comes out of the sea. Look at verse 1 of chapter 13. And I saw a beast rising out of the sea with ten horns and seven heads, with ten diadems on its horns and blasphemous, blasphemous names on its heads. This beast looks a little bit like the dragon, doesn't it? In verse 2, the beast is given authority by the dragon. In verse 4, it's worshipped alongside the dragon. In verse 5, it blasphemes the name of God. In verse 7, it's allowed to, to make war on the saints. Who is the beast? The sea beast represents any ruling authority that regards itself as the object of human worship. Those who demand to be worshipped as God and who persecute Christians for refusing to do so. In John's day, in the first century, it was the Roman Empire. Roman emperors demanded to be worshipped by their subjects and they often assume titles of deity. The Emperor Domitian, for example, demanded that he be called Lord and God. And Christians who remained loyal to Jesus and would not worship the Emperor were punished severely. Many were locked up and some were even killed. 
John warns his first century readers of this reality. You can see that in verse 9. If anyone has an ear, let him hear. If anyone is to be taken captive, to captivity he goes. If anyone is to be slain with the sword, with the sword must he be slain. And so the call in verse, verse 10 is a call for the endurance and faith of the saints. It's not just during the first century, is it? All the way down to our time now, Christians have suffered whenever ruling authorities have demanded allegiance that can only be given to God and the Lamb. North Korea continues to force its citizens to worship the ruling Kim family. If Christians are discovered to, uh, uh, if Christians are discovered, they're deported to, to labor camps or even killed on the spot. Uh, according to Open Doors, the website, around 50 to 70 thousand Christians are, to, are believed to be in labor camps. China continues to control the expression of Christianity in its country. There are reports that the government is supervising a plan to make a new translation of the Bible that will make socialist ideals and Chinese culture more uh, seem divine. Churches that have not been approved by the state are shut down. Listen to what one Chinese pastor said. The Chinese Communist Party wants to be the God of China and the Chinese people. But according to the Bible, only God is God. Now in Australia, we don't face that type of extreme persecution from the ruling state authorities, at least for now. But we do face a type of persecution from the ruling cultural authorities, don't we? Because anyone who refuses to bow down to the orthodoxy of political correctness and transgender ideology are publicly shunned, censored, and bullied into silence. These cultural authorities presume to be the arbiters of morality. They demand that every citizen sign up to their views and they punish anyone who refuses to do so. So you may be the subject of verbal or online abuse. You may have complaints made against you. You may be taken to court. You may even lose your job. So here is a call for endurance and faith to remain loyal to God. The second beast comes out of the earth. Verse 11. Then I saw another beast rising out of the earth. It had two horns like a lamb and it spoke like a dragon. The second beast doesn't look as terrifying as the first beast, does it? But it's deceptive. It's deceptive in both its appearance and its actions. It looks like a lamb, but it speaks like a dragon. In verse 12, it exercises the authority of the first beast. In verse 13 and 14, it performs great signs to deceive the people into worshipping the first beast. So who is the land beast? The land beast represents false teachers in the church, false religious authorities, those who encourage Christians to compromise with the culture's idolatrous institutions, those who deceive Christians into worshipping the ruling authorities rather than God. In John's day in the first century, it was probably the high priest of Asia and those associated with him. The high priest was responsible for ensuring the loyalty of the people to Rome by making them worship the emperor. And so verse 16 and 17 may be referring to financial sanctions that were applied to those unwilling to participate in the imperial cult. Look at verse 16. Also it, that is the land beast, causes all, both small and great, both rich and poor, both free and slave, to be marked on the right hand or the forehead, so that no one can buy or sell unless he has the mark. That is the name of the beast, the sea beast, or the number of its name, which is why verse 18 calls for wisdom. Let the one who has understanding calculate the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man, and his number is 666. Lots of ink has been spilt over this verse. I'm not going to spill much more ink over it. 
But the number of the sea beasts uh, is also the number of a certain man. Who is the man? Many attempts have been made to decode the name of the man, and there have been just as many solutions as attempts. The most common solution is that 666 stands for Nero Caesar, uh, who was a big persecutor of Christians in the first century. That's one a big solution. But more likely, as I think, the significance of 666 is in its symbolism. If this is apocalyptic literature, then I think that the symbolism here is what is going on. Seven is the divine number symbolizing completeness, and six falls just short. It symbolizes that the sea beast is neither divine nor eternal. Today there are false teachers in the church teaching Christians that it's okay, even necessary, to compromise with the cultural voices of our society. They teach Christians that faith is a private and personal matter and doesn't need to be expressed in public. They teach Christians that Jesus is a way to God, not the only way. They teach Christians that the loving thing to do is to let people live their own way rather than warning them about God's judgment. And they deceive Christians to worship the voice of our culture rather than the word of God. So here's a call for wisdom. To understand that the ruling authorities are neither divine nor eternal, they do not deserve the worship that is due only to God and the Lamb. And the call for wisdom is to discern what people are teaching you, to discern what I, standing here, am teaching you from the Bible, and to resist any temptation from false teachers to compromise your faith. Revelation 12 and 13 have taken us behind the scenes to see the enemy and his tactics. We must remember that Satan is powerful, and that is waging war against us through his earthly agents. But we must also remember that Satan has been conquered by the blood of the Lamb. He's a defeated enemy who cannot win. So how can we stand firm in the face of persecution? We can stand firm because we know our enemy and we share in Christ's victory over him as we hold fast to the gospel. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for Christ's victory at the cross, that through his death and resurrection, our sins have been wiped clean, and that we stand before you righteous because of what Jesus has done. Help us to keep trusting in him. But Father, we know that Satan continues to resist that we still await the day when Christ returns to establish his rule. And so we pray in the meantime, as we face his attacks, as we are persecuted by identifying with Christ, that as we, uh, as people hurl abuse at us or make fun of us, that you would help us to hold fast to the gospel, knowing that Satan's power of accusation has been dealt with, that he has been disarmed and defeated. Father, we pray that you help us to hold firm to the end, and not just to hold fast to the gospel ourselves, but to hold out the gospel to those who are still under your judgment, so that they may come to know you and the eternal life that is found in Jesus. And we pray this in his name. Amen.